Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Trinity Alliance Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. The sun is shining. The pollen counts are starting to go down slightly. Cars are getting a little yes, little less yellow. So that's a, that's a good thing. But welcome live stream. If you're worshiping and starting with us now or watching it later, we do welcome you. I'd like to draw your attention to the website, www.tachurch.com. Please take some time to go to the church website. Also, emails are sent out automatically early Friday afternoons. If you are not getting the email at the website, you can click on Contact Us, and you can fill out that form. But also, if you think you are signed up, check your spam and junk folders. Because a lot of times, especially with Gmail, the church emails are getting thrown into the promotions or the junk spam folder of Gmail. So take some time to look through your own email. But if you are not on, please fill out the Contact Us form on the church website. Also, take some time to go through the website. See what's happening here at Trinity Alliance Church, the things that are going on as we come into the summertime. Just become familiar with that. But please, at this time, stand with us as we're going to read God's Word. If you are at home, please stand as we read God's Word. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my God and my King. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked, for the Lord is a sun and shield. Amen. We have a God that is awesome, that is in control, that wants a relationship with each and every one of us. Let's enjoy worshiping the Lord this morning. Better is one day. Better is one day in your 
your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. The thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would see to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory Say that 
You're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to be. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me you're all together lovely you're all together worthy all together wonderful to me God's word in 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 36. Hear the word of God. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim good news of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Amen. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nation, the Lord 
reigns. Let the sea roar and everything it contains. Let the field rejoice and everything that is in it. Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy in the presence of the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his faithfulness is everlasting. Then say, save us, God of our salvation. And gather us and save us from the nations. To give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, Amen. and praise Amen. the Lord. God is good. His Amen. word will not return void. Praise him, the heart of worship. simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus King of endless word, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. sitting or standing, just in silence before him, thanking him for the great God that he is.
we thank you for the almighty and great God that you are. We thank you for your word as it, as it goes forth, Father. It will not return void. The power of your word is life-changing. We thank you for your word that it is the rock that our feet can stand on. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross. We have shed blood. Father, we pray for salvation in this day. There be one individual here that has not claimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, save. We thank you for who you are and what you have done, Father. Indeed, that we would have that heart of worship. That we would call and cry out to you. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. It's all that's going on, Father. You are good. You are faithful. You are just. We praise you. We boldly come before the throne of grace this morning, asking these things in Jesus' name. Seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Beautiful day. And um, I, I just want, wanted to read a few verses and then, and then j j just sh share a thing or two. Um, the first one would be John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Um, a few weeks ago, my, you know, my uh, brother-in-law Bob died suddenly, and, but he had a strong faith. And um, so did this first, I forget exactly what context it came up in, but it did come up, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, during the, the funeral itself. And um, now, you know, Bob, you know, he, you know, he, he had, he was happy. The last few years of his life, he was very happy, enjoying his wife and, I'm sorry, his, uh, you know, his, his uh, children and his grandchildren. And, um, but yet he was not afraid to die. And that's one of the reasons I truly believe in my, in my own life. I believe that uh, you know I can be so happy because I don't fear death. Praise God. And then um, so I have a few more verses. And, and um, I had this is John, that was John 14:27. This is John 16:33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And now, you know, you know both for my brother-in-law and, and myself, we have that, that peace that, that surpasses all understanding, you know, in, in, in not fearing death and things of that nature. But what about today? Well, what about today? Is that peace for us today too? Or is it just for the future? Well, no, you know, it, it's for us, us today too. We have that peace if we seek the Lord in prayer. And, and um, I, I just want to share one more thing. Um, and, and, and I felt that peace. And it was, um, you know, um, you know, you know um, my daughter Faith is, is still in missions. And, and you know, she's in, in the Middle East right now. And then, you know, like um, my daughter Sarah for, 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 for years was in missions as well. But there was a time when, um, you know, both of them were like in situations where, you know, like the government wasn't stable. And, you know, so as a parent, you know, I mean, boy, I, I was worried. And I mean, I, I was really worried, you know. And, and, um, and then, you know, um, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So I don't want to say that I was totally consumed by it, but, but it, it, it was up there. And then, you know, that I'm going to read another verse for you, and you'll see how applicable it is. It says um, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Maybe so many of us are, are already familiar with it. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition. Whew. 
with thanksgiving. <laughs> Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, hearts and minds, in Christ Jesus. And, and um, you know, dear people, I, I can honestly say, you know, when I truly, you know, I, I gave it to the Lord. I said, you know, um, you know, Lord, I'm, you know, I, you know, you know, I, I, I love my daughter. <sighs> Sorry. Sorry. You know, and what I, what, what can I do? Now the father, pray every day. I can support them, you know, and things of that nature. But the rest of it is like, Lord, I just, I need to give it to you. And, and th that day I truly did. I said, Lord, you know, I, I, I give it to you. And, and so here, I'm going to just, you know, finish my, 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 my little devotion here with, um, here, here again, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and, and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it, it was beyond my understanding. Beyond my understanding, the Lord took that, that worry, that concern, he took it away. And I could truly say, God is in control. God is in control. So, praise God. So, and, and now let's just pray, Lord. And, and Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful for your word, Heavenly Father. I'm so thankful, Lord, that, that you love us. And each, one of, each one of us, Lord, is important to you. You know us, Lord. You know us. Heavenly Father, what a, a kind, loving, and merciful God that, that you are. Heavenly Father, I just ask, please, that you, you'd be, be with those who are struggling at this time, Lord, and may, maybe through illness, illnesses or job loss. And Lord, I know with, um, you know, be, p p please be, be with, um, you, know, you know, Becca, who had, you know, on your know, recent surgery. And Lord, you know, on, you know, things of that nature, Heavenly Father. We, we thank you, Lord, for, for the gift of life. Lord, that, 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 that we, we would cherish it, Lord, in that, Lord, that, that you know, uh, we, we would be the people, Lord, God, that you'd have us to be. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just um, ask that, that you'd be with Pastor Jeff today, Lord, and that, Lord, that the words that, that, that he has for us today would be, uh, that we help us to understand it and help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, Lord, you know, for, 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 for your honor and glory. I thank you for this church, Lord. I just uh, praise thy great and holy name, Lord. And, and I thank you, Lord, that by, by you know, by, by your grace and mercy, Lord, that we, that you, I, I can truly say and we can say that you are our heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord, that we are adopted now, Lord, into your family. Praise God, Lord, that we are sons and daughters of, of and the almighty God. And it's, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Are you all ready to head home now after that? Thank you so much. Amen. Uh, what a good and filling morning already. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am really blessed, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do with his word this morning, uh, because I'm, I'm ready to head back home and like, okay, I'm refreshed. God, you, you really challenged my heart, and you've woken me up, and you've stirred my soul, and worshiping God, and hearing his word, and Praying together. It is, it is so good to see uh, everyone here this morning. For all of those who are starting to come back, it was good, you know, when the president said, hey, you know, you, if you're already vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks and all of those things. So everybody's starting to get more and more comfortable coming out. And uh, it just does my heart so good. And I want to again thank you as a church for how we love one another. We've been kind of covering 
the, the DNA of Trinity, what makes Trinity who we are, and we kind of put it into work so that we can really grab hold of what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and get the mission and vision so we're all running together. So the cool thing is, everything that I've been preaching on, it may be looking at it way, but it's something that you do incredibly well. My favorite story in Scripture, turn to it in, uh, in Luke chapter 5. I use this, uh, this story all the time, but I use it because it's so, it's home to me. Because this describes the people that we have here at Trinity. So I uh, just want to let you know, if you haven't been with us for the past couple weeks, or you haven't been in, in the small groups that we've been doing for the past couple weeks, these are the words that we are using to describe who we are and where we're going. First of all, the goal, when, when you are part of this church, when you come out, we have one goal, and that's to be passionate for God and to have compassion for others. That's what it's all about. Jesus was questioned, what's the greatest commandment? And his words were, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love others as yourself. And the law and the prophets, all of the law, all of the Old Testament hangs on these two things. That's what Jesus' reply was. And so why would we be any different? Our whole lives all should hang on a passion for God and compassion for others. And so that's where we're going. How do we get there? What do we do with other people? We invest in them and we invite them in deeper. Whether that's evangelism, where we just, we're building relationships with people who don't know Christ, and we're inviting them into a relationship with Christ, or it's building relationships with one another and those who are believers and strong believers and inviting them deeper into the deep end of the pool with us. And that's what we're doing, investing and inviting. So you're going to hear that word, those words all the time. Last week, we talked about being engaged and equipped. That that's our responsibility, that we are here not to just sit and consume and to hear and kind of soak in. We are here to be engaged. We have to be engaged in our relationship with Christ. We can't just wait for somebody else to read me scripture. Phil, that was amazing. Don't ever tell me you can't preach when I call you, all right? But that was encouragement. Where did that encouragement come from? It's because Phil is engaged in God's Word. And you could see how the engagement in God's Word wasn't just somebody else to say to him. It was, this is what my God is talking to me about. He's engaged. And because he's engaged, he's spending time in God's Word. He's being equipped to be able to share very clearly and very well what God is doing in our world, in his life. And he's equipped for the good work that God has for him. And so that's what we're doing. We are engaged and we are equipped. Today, we're talking about serving and sending. So I want to read to you this passage, because it's going to set up the culture of, of, the, of the world today and back then. And then we're going to dive into Romans. So turn with me to Luke 5. This is what it said. This is, again, my favorite story says this, uh, Luke 5, verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up onto the roof, tore the roof to shreds, <laughs> and lowered him on a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Look at the two different groups of people that are there. There are the Pharisees. There are the, the, the teachers of the law. These are the pastors of of that time. 
These are the people who are leading the people. These are the ones who, who push the culture. And this is the culture they're pushing. They are sitting there listening to Jesus because Jesus is teaching with incredible authority. He's gathering people and they're coming from villages all over to hear Jesus. And they're in a house. Now, we know they're in the town where Peter lives. So more than likely, this is Peter's house that Jesus is teaching at. This is just after the disciples uh, chose to follow Jesus. They're in that same area. So chances are they are at Peter's house. We don't have any proof of it, but I like to think of it as Peter's house because it's funny when his roof gets ripped off. But you have these, these men. I always see it as four guys basically carrying it. It doesn't tell us how many there are, but there were friends who carry this man to Jesus to bring healing. Let me ask you, there's one part of this that really bothers me. They couldn't get through. They couldn't get in. No one would let them in. Because it was so important for them to be there around Jesus and to hear what was going on. Who were they focused on? We want to say Jesus, but they weren't. They were focused on self. We don't know it, but there's this invisible prison that we live in. You ever seen those mimes that are like, oh, and they, I'm not good at it, so I'm not going to do it. I don't want it permanently on YouTube. You know, maybe I'll have Jimmy come up next service and do it. But you know mimes that like pretend they're in this box, right? And they, we do that and it's called self. We are in the prison of self. And when we are in the prison of self, we can't see other people. We can't move. We all know what it looks like. We just don't want to make eye contact right now because you're like, uh oh, how does he know? Because we all are. We all get so caught and imprisoned by our own self and selfishness. It makes us quick to anger, it makes us frustrated easily. It makes it so we don't see other people clearly. It makes it so that we are pleasure-driven people. And we can go on and on. And so you have all of these, these people who are imprisoned to self, who don't even see this guy on a mat. Now remember, in this culture, if you were disabled, it was probably your own fault or your parents had sinned. It was a condemnation. It just showed you were worthless. The fact that there were friends who were carrying him is crazy. That people truly cared for these, this guy. He was the, the lowest in society. You could gain nothing from him. He was just a, a burden and a weight on society. And that's how they were always treated. Yet there were four People, and I call them Trinity people because this is what Trinity does incredibly well. And they picked him up and they carried him and they tried to get in and they couldn't get in. But there's something in these people that wanted this man healed more than anything else in life. They are pushing through the crowd. They can't get in and they don't give up. So they climb up onto the roof, which first of all is not easy carrying dead weight. They get up onto the roof and they put the ceiling tiles apart and they lower him down. So they're a bunch of really smart engineers too. Instead of just, we probably would have just dropped him. Jesus is going to heal him anyway, you know. But they engineer something and they lower him down. And I want you to picture, this is the best part of the story. As you're sitting there watching, Jesus is teaching. Everybody's focused on Jesus. And this body is being lowered. You know, you see the dirt coming and Jesus is like, what? In the, and suddenly this body comes down. Why? Because there are people there who have eyes to see people for who they are. That this man had worth to them, and they brought him to Jesus. They served. While they were serving, did they think about themselves doing it? 
Not much, because if you're thinking about yourself, you're walking. They probably came from another village, and we're not talking like next door. We're not talking your house, <laughs> you know, to bring people here. That would be hard enough to carry me from here about four houses down. Right? You guys would start complaining after a little bit. Like, Jeff, too many donuts the other day. Come on, man. We're talking miles they had to have taken this man. And they carry him, whether it was on a cart, however they did it, it was work. Do you hear complaints? They wanted him healed. Their whole focus, their whole vision, they were no longer prisoned by themselves. They were there for one purpose. This man, because they loved him. And they carried him to Jesus. And he was healed. Well, we've taught this story a thousand times. We'll go over it again, all the different pieces. But I want you to see the culture. I want you to see the different mindsets. There were the Pharisees who even wouldn't let them in, who wouldn't make room. Oh, no, 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 then I can't hear. You're bothering me. And then there's the friends. I picture four, there was probably a handful more, that lower him down. So with that in mind, turn over to Romans 12. Romans 12 has to be the most revolutionary chapter, or chapter in the Bible. This is so anti-culture, so anti-everything that we know. Yet we hear it and we're like, oh, that's good, because we've heard it so many times. Let me read it to you again and have it with fresh ears. Romans 12, verse 1, and we're going to kind of go through almost all of Romans 12. We'll go as far as, as time will permit. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, first, you have to start there. You have to start with God's mercy in view. The first way out of the prison of self is putting your eyes on Christ. Putting your eyes on God's mercy and who he is. One of the easiest ways to be imprisoned in the prison of self is to look at your problem. Am I wrong? It's so easy, because then we start looking at our problems, and it all starts to fall apart. We look at all the things that we don't have. We look at all the things that we should have. We look at all the things that we want, and, all, and we just get the walls go up instantly. But it works in reverse, too. You take your eyes, and you lift them up, and you put them on God. And you keep your eyes in view of His mercy. Let me ask you, when you walked in these doors, was God's mercy in your view? Was God's mercy what you saw this morning when you first woke up? I don't know about you, I've got a crazy busy day ahead of me. God's mercy was not the first thing I looked at. I looked at all the things I had to do and how many minutes I'm short for the rest of the day of what I have to get done. No, we need to keep God's mercy in view. We need to keep telling the stories and sharing our testimonies with one another so that we can keep God's mercy in view. That's why fellowship is so important. We need to hear the stories of all the mercies that God has. How awesome and how merciful God is. When I keep that in front of me, I'm freed from the prison that's in front of me. That is the first and the most necessary step for true service. To truly be able to serve somebody, you have to keep God's mercy in view. That's where we start. So if you're taking notes, one, mercy. I'm not easy to take notes off of. But therefore, I urge you, we haven't even gotten through verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Die to self. See, the problem is, we are the most important people in our world. I hate to say it, but we are. Our thoughts, 99% of the time, are about us. Especially when we are in physical pain, especially when there is emotional pain. Man, it it just, it gets us to to become self-absorbed so easily. We have, I... We used to do this uh, thing called the Harvest Festival. Most of you guys remember that. We would, we would go to uh, Victory Farms, we'd go to the Darpinos Farm, and we would have these big blow-up things, that, toys that we would all play on. One of my favorite was, was called the bungee run. The bungee run was you would basically put this belt on, and it was attached to a bungee cord, which was attached to a like, rubber wall. And the goal was to run as far as you can. And you have this little thing that you kind of place on the Velcro. So you're running next to somebody. You're trying to get further than them. But the problem is, once you get far enough out, it snaps you back. Right? And so your feet are flailing. Your body's tumbling. It is the best thing to watch. I never ran on it, but I loved watching people. Because you would see them run and then just pshew, and their bodies just fly back into the wall. You know, how most people didn't die, I don't know. I don't know how insurance covers that thing, but, but it's awesome. But that's self to us. Self is this bungee cord that keeps snapping us back. It is the prison in which we are always pulled back to. When we, you would have people who would try to go slowly with this thing and it's pulling on them and they're trying so hard and there's this thing that's always constantly pulling me back. That self. It's self-centeredness. It's our focus. Look at Adam and Eve. That's where it began. What did Satan have to do? He had to get their eyes off of God's mercy and onto themselves. And it says, when she saw that the food was pleasing to the eye and useful for gaining knowledge, no God in there, she took it and ate it. Snap, right back against the wall. Into the prison of self. To the point where God comes to them and says, where are you? Well, we hid because we were naked. And God says, who told you? Whoever told you? put your eyes on you, you didn't know up until this point you had no clothes. Because you weren't focused on you. But the second you focused on yourself, boom, you're stuck in prison. Now we hide from God instead of seeking Him out. The prison of self that we live in. In view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy, I need to die to myself. He's not saying die to yourself and then good luck. He's saying, no, God is worth dying for. You're not trading in something for nothing. You're trading in self for him. It's completely different. We have this mentality, well, I just have to trade myself in for nothing. No, not at all. You've traded yourself in for him. And when we serve we become who God intended us to be. When we are outside of ourselves, we're who we're intended to be. And so in view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now here, here, this is revolutionary. Jesus says, no longer conform to the pattern of this world. Paul is telling people you cannot live the way the world does. You can't think the way the world does. No longer be conformed. He's saying, listen, I'm telling you to do something revolutionary. Don't be about yourself. Now, here's the hard part about reading Romans 12. There's, most Bibles have these breaks in them, right? Where you have kind of this break where it says, in my Bible it says, humble, humble service in the body of Christ. So I think, okay, that part was written, and then Paul goes and he changes topics. No, he's talking about the same topic. So this next verse, he's saying, okay, you've offered yourself as a living sacrifice. This is what it looks like. 
This is how it's played out. He says, for the grace given to me. So we start off by keeping God's mercy in view. Paul, with the grace of God in view, says, I can say this to you. So he says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, er, hold on. Scripture's talking to all of us? I thought he was just talking to the good ones. All of you. Who is he talking to? You. He's talking to each person. Paul says, every one of you. This is what God is saying. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Stop for a minute. We could spend months going through Romans 12. I'm flying through this like a jet engine. Think about what he just said. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Think of yourself with sober judgment. And what else? In accordance with the faith God has distributed each of you. What does it take to see ourselves for who we really are? Faith. If you do not have faith, then you are blinded to who you are. You have a hard time seeing yourself with sober judgment. You will always put self first unless you believe that there is a God who is worth serving. Unless there is something more important than you. And that takes faith. That takes you believing that God is God and you are not. So we have to stop for a minute. What we have to do is we have to put God's mercy in view. We have to keep God in our view. We have to keep him in front of us, keep our eyes on him. We also have to take our eyes off of us. We have to think of ourselves with sober judgment, not thinking about ourselves more highly than we ought. And it doesn't mean that false, well, I don't like myself, I don't think much of myself. No, he's saying don't think about yourself all the time. He's not saying, oh, just hate yourself. Because no, he says love others as yourself. He's saying here, no, you have to stop being the most important thing in the world. Think of yourself with sober judgment. Look at the universe that God created. Look at all of the other people that matter in this world. So we go back to these, the, uh, the Pharisees. They didn't let him in. Why? Because they thought more highly of themselves than they did someone else. The friends, what did they do? They sacrificed time. They served this man. Why? Because they thought not of themselves. And it wasn't because they hated themselves. They weren't like, well, I'm dirt, so I'll carry this guy. No. They said, no, I am strong. I have strength, so I can carry this guy. We have a warped mentality. When you have full strength, when you have power, then you also have responsibility. That is looking at yourself with sober judgment. It's saying, listen, I have this power. I have strength. I can carry this man. I have a responsibility to love him and to carry him and to bring him to Jesus where he will be healed. It isn't about tearing myself down. Oh, I can't do this. I'm not worth going in front of Jesus. Why would he do this for me? I'm a sinner. Somebody else take him who's more holy. Do you see how Satan uses that too? But who is that focused on? When we are so consumed with self criticism who were we focused on ourselves that's why he says <laughs> think of yourselves with sober judgment not think lowly of yourself he just says don't think all about yourself don't think so highly of yourself 
We have this mentality of that false, that false uh, humility. Oh, no, I'm just not any good at that. Or if, you know, you, you say to someone, hey, hey, you know what? You look really good today. Oh, no, I, this old thing? Yeah, no. We've got to tear ourselves back down. No. That's not what he's saying. He's saying with sober judgment, use what you have. Because this is where he's going to go next. So a sober judgment according to the faith, because you believe that there is a God, you have his mercy and his grace in front of you, because you believe in him, and the more you believe in him, the easier it is to look at yourself with sober judgment. For just as each of us has one body with many members, so what does that mean? This is Jeff. He has hands, feet, nose, eyes, shoulders, arms, right? I am one person with many members. And these members do not have the same function. My hands do completely different things than my feet. Have you ever tried to draw with your feet? We do that in youth group every once in a while. Try to have them draw pictures and stuff with your feet. It's impossible. Because your feet were not created to draw. Have you ever tried to walk on your hands? That's not easy. There's a couple people in here that can do it. Not me. I try to walk on my hands. My hands weren't created to walk on. They were created for the fine motor skills. My feet weren't. They're made for different purposes. So just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though we are many, in this room, online, in the next service. Although, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. I love that verse. You know why? Because you belong to me. And some of you are okay with that. Some of you are like, no. No. No, you belong to me. We need each other. There are people that you can reach that I can never reach. You have gifts and talents that you have that I don't have. We together form the body. It is not, hey, pastor, go. Look at him go. Great job. You've done some really good work there. No, it takes this entire church to get moving. Some of you are the feet. Some of you are the hands. Some of you are the brain. Some of you are the eyes. Some of you are the mouth. Some of you are the heart. We all belong to this. Every one of you. You belong to each other. <coughs> Even if you're online, I know you feel you don't belong, but you do. You belong to the body of Christ, and we need one another. My heart is so good seeing so many of you who have come back for the first time again after over a year of being here. We need each other. We all have different gifts. We all have a different part. Please do not just sit in the pews and then disappear every week. It would be like my hand that just never gets used. I just keep it in my pocket all day and I don't get to use it. It comes out every once in a while to open a door and it goes back in and never is used again. We need you. We need each other. If you think just not being here one week ah, doesn't really matter, no, you're part of more than just church. Remember, what is church? It's us. It's all of us. And we need to start moving together. We need to start serving. We need to get outside of the prison of self. And start serving with one another and being involved together. We need to be investing and inviting. We need to be engaged and equipped. We need to be serving and we need to be sending. That's who we are and that's what we do together. It's not done by an organization. It is done by the church. And that's you. You play a huge role here. I know you don't feel it. But you do. And this is what he then begins to tell you. 
okay? We have different gifts according to the grace that God has given us. We don't all have the same gift. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do so cheerfully. He's saying, listen, whatever, this is not an exhaustive list. A lot of churches use this as an exhaustive list. Like, oh, okay, you, some of your gifts don't really fit in here. They belong out in the world. No! He's saying, listen, no, these are all of the things that you can do. You've been given all kinds of gifts. You've been given the gift of encouragement. Most people don't even know what gift they have. I will tell you, if you come here, chances are you've been given the gift of encouragement, the gift of serving. Those are the two that I see all the time brought in here. You do it so well, you are the ones carrying this guy, putting him through the roof. That's who Trinity is. That's our DNA. But use all of the gifts that you have. If it's to lead, then lead. If it's to teach, then teach. We should not have any trouble finding small group leaders, ever. We should never have trouble finding homes to run a small group in. But the reason we do is because we get imprisoned in the wall of self. I'm not good enough to teach. I'm not good enough to do this. I don't know. You know what? It's my house. I don't know if I necessarily want, you know, Jeff coming over. He's got a lot of kids. They messed stuff up. I've seen his house. You know, we have these, all these excuses that we use not to are all because of this prison of self. Why are you not encouraging if you have the gift of encouragement? You may be saying, well, I don't have the gift of encouragement. Sure you do. Use some of it. Send a note to somebody. Reach out to somebody. You're carrying around a cell phone that somebody else is also carrying around a cell phone. Send them a message. It's not that hard. But why don't we? Because I don't think about it unless they're right in front of me because of the prison of self. Giving. Do you know this year has been an incredibly difficult year at Trinity. We, I don't know if you were here for the annual meeting, we cut $100,000 off of our budget. We used to be $350,000. We cut over $100,000 from our budget, and our budget is now $250,000. And we're not even still reaching budget. And I'll tell you, the only reason is because of the, the barrier of self. Well, what if the economy goes or out of sight, out of mind? It's not right here. We are struggling to get children's church workers. Why? Not because we don't have people who know how to handle and work with kids. We've got more kids than anything. We've got parents out the wazoo, and we've got the best parents in the world here. But it's because I, I don't want to give up this. And, and we don't realize how imprisoned we are. That's why it's an invisible prison. That's why we have such a hard time. Even ushers, you come to church, we have a hard time getting ushers, people to greet people at the door. You love greeting people. We have a hard time starting church because you won't shut up and stop talking to each other. Put on, a, put on one of the shirts and go do that. You do it naturally. But why don't we? Well, I don't know if I can commit. Because commitment messes with my prison. For so many people, I have asked them to come and to lead in different things. And they say, I can't lead. I, I, you know what? I just, I'm not gifted in that. I'm not comfortable. Step outside of your comfort zone. Whenever you have a problem with your own comfort zone, literally what you're saying is, I've hit the wall of my box. In the prison of self, I can't move. And all I'm doing is saying, well, let's get out of your prison of self and let's go do something. God will equip you if he calls you. He always has and always will. Moses had no idea what to do with people wandering around in the desert. 
But God equipped him and made him one of the greatest leaders of all time. Why? Because God's the one who's in control, and in view of his mercy, we can go. Our problem is we get stuck in this prison of self, and it's time to climb out. It's time to break that down, and the only way out is the opposite, is what Jesus said. Love God, love others. A passion for God and compassion for others is the only way out of the prison of self. Because when we start concentrating and working on other people and loving them and thinking through them, man, self just disappears, doesn't it? As a parent, it happens all the time. You're sitting there holding your little one. You don't exist. (laughs) It's your baby. I would not wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but when my child cries and wants to be fed, I'm getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning. The prison of self then starts to complain about the 2 o'clock in the morning. But would you really change it for anything? No. You would like some sleep, yes. And that's where the church comes in and where we serve one another and we come to mamas and we say, hey, can I hold your baby while you sleep? Can I watch your child while you get a break here? Nurseries should be full of people wanting to serve someone else. We have this mentality, even when we walk in church, that this is about us. This is not about you. Church is about a passion for God, and it's time to get to work. You walk through those doors, you should be looking at everyone around you and say, how can I help this person? How can I help them grow? How can I help them know Christ better? And if it's a a mama who's tired, say, listen, I know you're tired. I'll hold your baby. I'll tell you, this one, Sherry, She will hold any baby you ever get close to. She is a baby snatcher. Am I wrong? Most people think she has 400 kids because she's always holding somebody's kid. But this church is full of people who love to do that. But do that with the mentality of what can I do to serve you? How can I help you? I loved it when Dot and Lyman were here. I remember Dot coming in. It was raining. Somebody looked at Dot and said, can I go get your car? And they went and they pulled the car up as close as they could to get Dot here. Then the ushers crowded around her to cover her with an umbrella. Because she mattered. And when she walked out that door, she felt like she mattered. And it wasn't because a whole bunch of people came here to get fed and then head home. No, a bunch of people came here to get to work. Because the prison of self, we leave outside. A lot of us go back out, pick it up, and take it back in our car with us. But the prison of self does not belong here. I love Chuck and Rich. I used to joke that the grass didn't grow here. Because it was always short. Trees just disappear. How? I have no idea. That tree that was out front, did anybody else see it disappear? No, we're all just like, oh, the tree's gone. If it dies, it disappears. Because they think differently. This is revolutionary what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, Think less of yourself. You need to love and be all about people. I haven't even gotten to the great verse I want to get to, and this is where it is. We're going to skip everything else. Down to verse 9. Love must be sincere. It has to be real. You can't fake love. It has to be sincere. These changes we're asking in you, they have to be real. And if if, you, if you're here to just try to pretend your way through it, it doesn't work. To get out of the prison of self, you have to be sincere. You have to start seeing people for who they are. It's time to start to serve. Your life is here to serve. I know you don't like hearing that. My kids bring that up all the time. What am I, your servant? Yes. Honestly, if Jesus Christ came from heaven not to be served, but to serve, yes, you darn skippy, you're a servant. 
Who are you if God himself came to serve to say, ah, who am I? You're a servant? Yes, we all are. I want you to have that mentality. The same mentality as Christ. Why am I here? Well, I'm here to serve because Jesus came to serve and not to be served. But man, stop for a second and think. We walk through these doors and we complain about the music. We complain about the, the sermon. We complain about, you know, whatever. Because we walk through these doors and we have this mentality of what did I get? Is that what Jesus would do anytime he walked into a room? Why would we want anything different than to do what Jesus did? Jesus walked into a room and he's like, here, I'm going to serve this guy. But look at the Pharisees. They're all wrapped around Jesus, all trying to get what he wants. This is our view of what church is. No, shh, quiet. He's preaching. You're distracting me. But I want to bring somebody to Jesus and I want him healed. Da -da, shh, shh, shh. Stop it. Is that how we are? Well, I know, that's not how Trinity is, but is that how we are as a people? Jesus came to serve. Jesus didn't sit there and this guy drop out of the ceiling and go, come on! I was on a roll! I had these guys! Now you're disrupting me? Get up, pick up your mat, and get out of here. You know, that's not what he did. He stopped everything because he was there to serve. And he actually says to him, your sins are forgiven. And smiles at him. And the guy up in the roof looks down and says, what? I carried him this way so his sins could be forgiven? Who cares about that? Heal the man. And Jesus says, so that you know I have the power to forgive, pick up your mat and go. If we want to see people being healed, we better start getting outside of our box. Those Pharisees will never see a healing. And they probably didn't. Because when Jesus forgave his sins, they're like, who is this guy that can forgive sins? Come on. Let's get outside of the prison of self. And serve. Serve one another. Love. Encourage. Grow. Push all be all in we need we need people to serve here in the church in the community that your life becomes a life of service does that define you it defined christ so if it doesn't define you there's something missing you're trapped in a prison you had no idea you were in let me pray for you our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, love must be sincere. Whew. How? We're so insincere because we love ourselves more than anything else. Lord, I pray that this morning you would open our eyes to see the prison that we're in. The prison of self and how easy it is to get snapped back into it. Jesus, we need you. We need you to free us from this body of death that we, we have created. This prison that we have put ourselves in. Help us to see you, acknowledge you in all of our ways. God, you are an amazing God. We need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please join us in standing as we close with Christ is Enough.
cut that bungee cord that keeps pulling us back. Father, we are no longer slaves to sin. But we keep selling ourselves into this prison. And Father, we need you. Jesus Christ has ransomed us and has set us free. And we live free indeed. God, I thank you for a church that serves so well and sends so generously. But Lord, I pray that you would grow us in all of this, that you would teach us to truly have a heart like Christ, to serve one another, to serve you with everything that we have. 
Lord, I do pray for the giving here at Trinity. Lord, I pray that you, you would free up the giving. Lord, you are the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So, Father, will you open the doors that our youth might be free to do even more, that our, all of our ministries would be free, that we might be able to send missionaries, support, support church plants. Lord, all of the things that you are calling us to. So, Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you are a God who is actively involved in his children. I thank you that you're a God who doesn't just demand us to serve, but was willing to serve. Show us, teach us, and grow us. Give us true humility. Don't let us fall for that false humility. Give us eyes to see people for who they really are. Give us the generosity in our hearts to care and to serve the way we need to. Give us a compassion for others, Lord. I praise you for how mighty you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. An opportunity for service. Next Saturday, there is going to be a uh, celebration of life service here next Saturday for Donna Ireland. Many of you here may know her and those that are new may not, but it will be here. I believe it's going to be at from 10 to 11 in the morning. And after that time, there will be a meal that will be open to anybody. But the cleaning up of that, we will need help. So if you are interested in being a hand and helping at all, if you can't be here for anything but can at least be here for cleaning up, it's probably going to be around 12, 15, 1230, the cleanup process of tables, chairs, garbage, cleaning of the kitchen to help the family. I think food will be catered in. Um, but if you are interested at all for maybe giving an hour of time next Saturday, many hands make light work, they say. So it would be <laughs> wonderful. Please come and see me, yep. and um, I can help give some more information. Pastor Jeff will also have a role in the message on, that, uh, on Saturday. So once again, it is a celebration of life service for Donna. Encourage people to come on out, those that know the family or, or have known her. Um, 10 o'clock next Saturday will be that time, but then there will also be a time of uh, help and service. So awesome. please come and see me or Pastor Jeff. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. You are dismissed. Have a great week.